Welcome to Tuesdays with Andrea. It's the inspiration station for everyday people guiding humanity forward. I'm your host, Andrea Rios McMillan, and every week I pursue conversations that matter with people who can relate to the common struggles we all face. You'll get to know the person behind the profession and find commonality with people of all ages, cultures, and backgrounds. Listen as friends, neighbors, and coworkers offer meaningful, personal explorations of modern life and the values we hold dear, all for the purpose of strengthening and uplifting others. Today, we have Lisette Martinez, Vice President of Sales at Comcast, board member of CompTIA, and girl boss extraordinaire. She's also one of my best friends, I soul sister at heart. We worked together at Best Buy years back, and I'm so happy that you're able to join me in the studio today. I know, I'm so delighted to be here, Andrea. Thank you for having me. Of course, anytime. And I am excited because we get to talk about personal things, and we get to talk about feelings. You know how much I love feelings. Feelings are my <laughs> this is, favorite. This is sarcastic because she doesn't <laughs> like to. <laughs> she for, doesn't, you, for you, I will, though. Thank for you. For you, I will. I appreciate it. Do we want to start with how we met? I love that story. Okay. I love telling that story, and it's ingrained in my mind. And this is kind of the uh, epitome of what a good girlfriend is. And for me, I've worked with all kinds of people, but when you feel like a genuine connection to someone, because they're just so happy you're you. Yes. Like that was what I felt when I met you. And so I remember I was presenting in some meeting. I don't even remember what the meeting was. I do. It was a reward zone for a school meeting. Oh my God. Yes. Yeah. And Rich Ferraro was like, Andrea, you should go. You should community engagement. This is your thing. Like go. And I'm like, okay, I'll go. And I meet you. I see you there. And you look like me. (laughs) <laughs> we're semi the same age and you were a general manager at yeah. the time and I'm a, a sales associate and I was so impressed by your ability to rise through the ranks in a, you know best buy male dominated workforce and especially retail so you have to have just a different type of of skin mm-hmm. and you were so approachable <clears throat> You were so approachable. And I remember going to you like, hi. Hi." (laughs) You're like, I just want to meet you. And I was like, cool. What did you think? I was flattered. I mean, I I worked my way up the ranks at Best Buy and then did the same at Comcast. And um, as you know, was recently promoted to VP at Comcast, which was a big goal of mine for a long time. And the interesting thing is that people see someone like themselves I find it so surprising how much that alone connects with people. For all people know, I could be a jerk, but just because I'm a female in, in at that time in, in a very male-dominated um, environment, uh, younger, Latina, all of those things that, that people connect with, and I'm always conscious of that and have become more conscious of it as, as I've grown in my career. At the time when we met, not conscious of it at all. I was like, I'm just doing me. Like, I don't know. I'm just here. I'm just here. Yeah, totally. And it was very touching for me to have that kind of a reaction. And so I was just very drawn uh, to you. And, and, you know, when you think about it, too, in retrospect, it takes a lot of courage, in my opinion. I'm an introvert at heart. So it takes a lot of courage to come up to someone and say, like, wow, like, I'm I, I want to meet you like that, that. And so that's you. That's right? yeah. We're, we're opposite in that. No, in we're this. I'm like you too. You know what, what gave me that um, ability to do that was when I was 14, I went to Texas and my cousin was um, having a quinceanera, a 15 year old coming of age birthday party type of thing. I'm there with all of these other girls who I don't know. And I'm, I immediately go back into my shell like, <laughs> Oh, you know, and, and, and I freeze and I hide. I want to hide, but I'm in an open room. And so you can't hide. Everybody sees you, you see them. And so the question is, what do you do about it? This other girl that I didn't know, she sees me, you you make eye contact. And I kind of like, you know, like, oh, forget it, forget it. She walks right up to me. She goes, hi, my name's Esperanza. What's your name? And I'm like, Andrea. (laughs) She's like, I'll be your friend. I love that. And she... She just that, like she was genuine and we became like really close friends. That was basically what happened. That's basically, it was Esperanza, (laughs) like, I'll be your friend. Yeah. 
And I wanted to be your friend because I knew that you had something that I didn't have. You know how like you meet people and some people you gravitate towards? Yeah. It's because there's something in you that is growing in that area and there's something in you that connects. Yeah. You totally, know, totally. that's what it was, I think. Yeah. And so, yeah, I mean, that's how you and I met and, you know, the rest is history and we've been friends for years. I always talk about our friendship. I used our friendship in service of my motherhood. Like, what you do you were, mean? You were, you were a mom at a much younger age than I was. And I was still pretty young too. Right. And yeah, I remember becoming a mother and I was so overwhelmed and I was like, I need to call Andrea. Like she could show, and I, I've, I've shared this with you before, but I remember calling you like, I have to meet up with you. Like I'm tired and I'm trying to balance work and being a new mom and then just learning how to be a mom. Right. That's, that's hard as it is. And so and I feel like you and I, we did things backwards in a sense. And yeah. we bonded over that initially. We're like, we didn't do things a conventional way, nope. but we did it our way. Yeah. And we're going to find a way to make it work. And what's the secret? Tell me what to do. And I feel like <laughs> the way that you were able to bounce ideas and, and things with motherhood, because by the time I had met you, my kids were already like older yeah. in, some, in some sense. And you were just getting started with Izzy's, with the pregnancy and things like that. But then you were able to help me develop career-wise. Yeah. Like confidence and remember Wits, the woman in... in yeah, yeah. Or no, not Wits. What is it called? Um, the Best Wh Buy Woman of Wolf, Leadership Forum. Yes. Yeah, Women of Leadership Forum. And you were yeah. the one who was like, you should go to this. Come yeah. with me. Yeah. And then it was there at that forum. I don't know if you know this. So in that forum, I was still living in an apartment. And they asked you, what is it that you really want? at this time. And the only thing I really wanted at that time was to own my own home. But I lived in an apartment and I, it wasn't possible. Like my mom never owned her own home. Like to me, it was not, and I'm working, I'm making like nine, 12 bucks an hour, two kids, my husband's working night, you know, like you just don't have money. And I didn't even want to say the words out loud because I was embarrassed. And at one of those meetings, Felicia Riley, she's like, Whatever it is, deep down, you have to write it down and you have to say it. Mm -hmm. And then all I wrote was home. <clears throat> and in that meeting, I said it out loud and I was like, oh, fine. <laughs> and then within about three months, we had this house. That's awesome. Isn't that crazy? Like yeah. how those things happen? I think it's interesting. You talk about where you were and what seemed so impossible at the time. And I have this, this philosophy of, sometimes whether it's a challenge that we run into in our lives personally, professionally, and sometimes those problems can feel so big. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I think a lot about is like, just take that very next step. So for you in that moment, it was say it, mm -hmm. put it, put it out, just into put the, it out yes, there, put it out into the universe. That was your first step of probably many. Yeah. And when I look at my upbringing, I mean, I don't yeah. know. I think the first step is saying, come with me yeah. to this event. That, actually, yeah. Like yeah. that's actually one of the first steps is yeah. I know this place that's actually pretty good. It's, it's awesome safe. at developing. It's in yeah. safe space. And you can talk and talk about your goals and your dreams with other professionals. And it's with trusted people. Mm -hmm. That I think is the first step. But the act of taking it, you yes. just have to take it. And yeah. I think... A lot of times people are like, oh man, like, and you hear this all the time. People have this uh, idea of what success looks like uh, and everybody's idea is different. <clears throat> What's yours? Happy kids, a happy marriage and generational wealth. I, that sounds really simple <laughs> and hard. <laughs> so hard. Uh, all of those three, so hard. But in all reality, that idea of saying it out loud in your example, it matters. And then you look back and you're like, oh, damn, like I did that. That like, wasn't that bad. Yeah. It happened. No, sometimes it is that bad. Yeah. But, <laughs> but well, it happened. And I did it. Yes. And I accomplished it. And yeah. I did it. And look how far I've come. And I think in the moment, it doesn't feel that way. In the moment, it, you're overwhelmed. You can't see the forest through the trees. And I think the, the thing that I try to always remind myself is just take the next step. Just focus on that next step. And then uh, next thing you know, you're buying your next home. So Yeah. <laughs> what was that moment for you? That feeling of, um, I did it. Professionally, it's this moment right now. I've worked so hard to 
to get to this place where I feel like, okay, I, I can sit still for a little while. For those who don't know my career, probably since I started working for Best Buy, I've promoted into a new role every couple of years. I look at my resume and I'm like, I, I, I never stayed still. It was always progressing and working my way up the ranks. That takes a lot of work and, and pushing yourself constantly. And, you know, every time you get into a new role, you're learning it and proving yourself all over again. So there's time and energy that gets invested in that. Now, fast forward to today, it was really kind of surreal. My, my boss, when he told me I was getting the VP role, <laughs> he said, you know, take it in, enjoy it. This is like your 30 seconds of fame kind of thing. And it lasted way longer than that. I was like, okay, like we're done. I'm good. But it's very surreal to kind of look back to where I came from and where my family came from and to have accomplished that. It felt really good. And it, more than anything, I've always wanted to make my family proud. And I feel like I'm there. So I feel like I can sit back for a little bit when I look back and I'm like, oh man, like I, you know, came from working as a part-time employee at Best Buy. Like that's how I started my career, you know? Did you start at Best Buy as part-time as in high school, just as a whim? Like here's my first job, I'm applying here. Well, it was not my first job actually. I started working when I was 14. I worked at a grocery store and I would walk to the grocery store to go to work every day. So and I'd go do you tell school. your kids that now? And they're like, yeah, right, mom. <laughs> yeah, right. So I started out as like a bagger. Yeah. <laughs> and I like take so much pride in it. I was like, I was the best I'm the bagger. Best bagger. I was the best ba I can bag the heck out of your groceries if you ever need me to. Um, look, look how fast I am. <laughs> <laughs> like for real, real talk. And not just fast. You gotta make sure you don't like smash the eggs or the bread. <laughs> like you can't put the meat with everything else. I have standards when it comes to bagging my groceries. So then I, I moved on. I went to be a cashier and then I went and got promoted to bakery. Like <laughs> I've always taken so much pride in my work. And the way I learned about the job at Best Buy, my supervisor at the grocery store, her husband was a sales manager at Best Buy. She was like, you gotta apply for this job. And I was like, cool. So I went I applied at the, at the time it was the Best Buy in Addison. So I, I, I went, I applied for a sales role and I've never done sales. And it was nerve wracking. At the time we were like in this cramped little closet room and the, my sales manager was like, you need to sell me this fan. And I'm like, what? What do I do? And so he made me role play selling him the fan. So Anyway, I, I got hired and was the only girl on the sales floor, which I was always like aware of that. And How so, was that? It was, in, in a lot of ways, it was good. The folks I worked with at Best Buy were amazing. You know, they were always teaching me about the technology and how to sell stuff. And then eventually I was teaching them. Mm -hmm. It was never on purpose that I was going to make a career out of that. I just enjoyed it so much. Mm -hmm. and I think for anybody who's trying to find their way in their professional life, you just have to find the things that you really get enjoyment out of because ultimately that's where you show up your best. And so for me, I love being competitive. Um, I enjoyed the thrill of like a sales quota. Like I loved it. Or I making just, the sale, closing yes, the sale, all of it, getting the bonuses and yes. you hit your budget reward. <laughs> like all of it. And then it starts over again and I'm ready. Like, let's go. And so, you know, really enjoying that, that work. And then eventually one of my supervisors was like, hey, you have to apply for this leadership role. I was 18. I, mean, I was young. I was a kid. And I was like, okay. So I was working full time and, and in school. And my dad lost his job. And things shifted. And we didn't come from money. When I was younger, we lived in like this tiny little apartment in Little Village. And just you and your two sisters and your mom and at, your dad? At the time, it was just my older sister and I. My younger sister wasn't born yet. But Nothing was ever missing for us. We always had food on the table. We had clothes. But um, my dad kind of shared this, this story with me that broke my heart. I have this vivid memory. We used to have this big, giant piggy bank. It was like the ceramic piggy bank. Yeah. And I remember as a kid, I have this, this memory of, of him breaking the piggy bank and like all the coins. And I was so happy. I was like, oh, my oh, God. This, this is money time. <laughs> yeah. And I was like, it was like a happy moment as a, as a child. But... He told me that the reason they broke the piggy bank is because they couldn't pay rent. And I was so both impressed 
But then it was like, oh man, like that must have been really hard for my parents, right? To have two kids and to, to just trying to make ends meet. And then eventually they moved us to the suburbs. My dad did well with his work. He, in fact, he taught me a lot of the, the leadership skills that I then leveraged at Best Buy. You know, I, I eventually went on to, to get promoted at, at Best Buy a, a number of times until eventually I became a general manager for uh, a number of different stores throughout Chicago. I spent 11 years at Best Buy. And then when I became a mom, it was kind of a pivotal moment. It was a fork in the road for me. And it was time for me to explore something different. And I think, you know, that's what brought me to Comcast. And I kind of rinsed and repeated, worked really hard, um, moved my way up the ranks. And, and so now we're here. And when you were working your way up and you're at Best Buy, but then you're also thinking about your future, like maybe it's time to leave. Now I'm a mom and I need something else. What actually made you make that step? You've been there for so long, so that has to be a hard decision. Mm -hmm. And Best Buy was so good to me. That's what made it harder. You know, Best Buy, incredible company, invested so much in their people from a, a talent development perspective. I had so many wonderful opportunities that, that quite frankly, set me up for success at Comcast. From them embracing women in uh, leadership in a retail and, and technology environment, to opening doors from a sponsorship and development perspective. And then I worked for great bosses there. You know, one person that always is near and dear to me uh, in terms of best leaders that I've ever worked for, Scott Azera. You know him and so I'm, I'm grateful for What would you tell that. Scott if he's watching? I hope he is watching. I sent him a message when I got promoted to VP. Uh, so, you know, they, they send out all these announcements and they, they send out publications and all that stuff. And so he learned about it and he, he was like, wow, I'm like, I'm so proud of you. And, and I said to him, I said, you know, you're a big reason why I am where I am. And I just want to thank you because there's leaders that nurture your talent and it takes time and energy to do that. Mm -hmm. And it's, a, it's really a selfless act, right? And he was someone who gave me the space to learn and to make mistakes. And that goes so far when you're so young and learning. Mm -hmm. And he was just that leader that he didn't just care about your results, but he cared about you as a person. And I remember you know, there were challenging leadership moments at Best Buy where he took me under his wing and, and made sure that I had the support that I needed to be successful. And so I'm very keenly aware that if it wasn't for leaders like Scott, that uh, I, I just wouldn't be where I am today. And so you want to pay that forward mm -hmm. uh, when, when you get into a role where you impact people's lives. And, and, and so that's something that I'm, I'm conscious of. And you want them to know this is the, because a lot of times we can move on and they might not never know yeah. the, the true impact that they make. It stays in our heart and our mind and we treasure that. But I think that's another important part is um, letting them know because that makes a big difference also. Yeah. What I think is so wild, their stories and their teachings become your own. Then you start teaching other people and you know that it came from that leader. Yeah. Uh, the people you're teaching it to think you know, they, they think you're smart. <laughs> yeah, they think you're smart, but in reality, like it, you know, those I were, got this from somewhere. Yeah, those were handed down, and so that's what makes it good. That's what yeah. makes it really treasured, and because you know, there's something to it. Yeah. So Alyssa was also my boss for a few years. <laughs> so this is our relationship. First, it was like, man, I'm impressed by you. Will you mentor me? It was a, a really great mentorship relationship, and then after a few years. We were working together now. Mm -hmm. I'm your direct report and I'm pregnant. You had just had Izzy. And this is the thing about Lisette is she was the first one in the building. She was the last one to leave. In the wintertime when it's cold, you didn't even wear a coat. You would have like this like blue sweater thing. And I'm like, aren't you cold? You're like, I'm fine. I'm just going to go to the car. And it was just incredible work ethic. Almost the type that you don't want as a woman. <laughs> and let me tell you why. Because she's the type like... I just had a baby and I'm a general manager of a store and I'm handling this big business. Deal with it. Handle it. And I'm mm -hmm. like, <laughs> what do you mean? <laughs> <laughs> but it's so great. So it was a, a phenomenal learning opportunity. Um, I learned so much. You're not the first, probably won't be the last person to describe me as a tough boss. 
I remember interviewing for one of the promotional jobs at Comcast, not not the, the current role I'm in. And my boss at the time, who eventually became my boss, he said, what would your team say about you? And the way I described myself was tough but fair. Yeah. And I'm tough on myself, too. I, I have high standards for myself, too. You and know, look where it leads you. I am, by nature, a very assertive person. And in a woman that can be perceived as aggressive. In a man, it's assertive. A man is perceived as confident. A man is perceived as leadership. A man is perceived as decisive. Yep. In a woman, you know, she's uh, difficult and she's... um, Bossy. She's a bitch. She's a bitch. Yeah. So all those words I'm very familiar with. (laughs) I enjoy my work deeply. I always have. I love working with people. I've loved serving in leadership. And over the years, I've, I've grown into uh, someone who genuinely believes that what we do matters. What we do matters. It doesn't matter if you are a bagger, a bagger. at a grocery store or the VP of a Fortune 50 company. I mean, what we do matters because ultimately we're in the people business. We're working with people. We make an impact on people's lives. That day that we met, think about the journey that that's led us on. And if I didn't approach my work through that lens of what we do matters, then I I wonder what I would have missed out on Mm. and the relationships and the connections that I've made and the family that I've created. All of that is because of this philosophy of what we do matters. And so, you know, I think people uh, don't always approach their work in that way, but our work, it's not who we are but it certainly creates a platform for us to be creative and to help people Mm -hmm. and to reach our goals and, you know, our dreams Mm -hmm. of buying a home or building generational wealth Mm -hmm. or whatever. Right. And, and so I think ultimately I've been lucky to have uh, the privilege of growing through my leadership journey. I think it's hard work. You're working with people and everyone is different, right? So how you talk to someone, how you motivate them, how you inspire them. It's all different with every single person. And so you have to learn that every time you have a new team, every time you have a new direct report or whatever it may be, you have to learn what, what's their why. And then how do I, how do I use that? I didn't have that perspective back then. It's grown into that back then it, it was work ethic and it was show up, show up. It was this tenaciousness to just get mm-hmm. the job done and we're going to do it together. There's no ego. We're going to get there. And there's the other part of it too, right? Is there is no ego in it. Like no. I'm the boss and you have to listen to me. It was really all about the goal. Yes. Like how do we get there? Yeah. You lead with humility and you lead with work ethic. Yeah. And as you, <laughs> as you grow in your career, you figure out how little you actually know. <laughs> really, you do, you're not the expert of things, right? And the higher you go, uh, the more that you have to rely on your team to get you across the finish line. And so, yeah, it's definitely been a, a, a learning journey. So when you're working in your roles and you're advancing, you're on the move, you're really learning and then applying and then moving on to the next. How do you pace yourself? And how do you deal with also having a family, and you're working all the time. How do you balance those two things of rest and pace? And then, oh, by the way, (laughs) there's these people over here that (laughs) that need me. Yeah, yeah. Uh, You know, transparently, it's been a journey for me. Before I had kids, I could work all day, every day. I'd get up at four in the morning to go open the store up and merchandise and stay till close. We worked weekends, holidays, I, I could work 70, 80 hours a week and not blink. And I was fine with that. When I became a mother, whether I recognized it or not, there was conflict internally mm. about how I was going to be the best leader that I could be and be the best mother that I could be. And I found myself really conflicted and not understanding how I was going to move forward. And Best Buy was awesome in that moment in time. They offered so many different options for me. But the schedule. Um, 
But at the end of the day, there's also like the expectations you put on yourself. And I was learning to be a mother. Mm -hmm. It wasn't even just having this little person, but you're learning how to be a mom. It's Mm -hmm. overwhelming. And so I made the decision to leave because I needed something that would give me flexibility. It wasn't about balance. People talk about work-life balance all the time. Uh, I think that's BS. Uh, There's no such thing as balance. Things can be out of balance and you can feel fine. And what I mean by that is there's times when I have to give more at work and there's times when I have to give more at home. And so it's never really balanced. It's more like I have to be flexible and I have to learn when I have to shift directions. And so working for for Comcast and in the types of roles that I was in gave me the flexibility that I needed to do what I needed. And even then struggled. Yeah. Because there's a learning process in that. And so for anybody that struggles with balancing it all, the first thing that I would tell my younger self would be to self-assess. Like, what is it that you need to create a support system that allows you to do the things you need to do? So that could mean, does my job support that? Does my company support that flexibility? Um, and in some some jobs are not made for that. Yeah, like right? Best Buy, you had to be there. This you had to be a there. Business, you have you to be open. Holidays, the building. no one else is going to do it. Right, and so that's not Best Buy's fault. That's right. just the business that they're in, right? Mm-hmm. And so, I think that self assessment, and I think the other important part about self assessing, is make sure to filter out the guilt part of it, because sometimes. We impose our own restrictions because we feel guilty. What do you mean by this? Tell me a little bit more. Tell me more. (laughs) So what I mean by that is like, I'll use myself as an example. You describe me as someone who's like strong work ethic, first one in, last one out. Those are self-imposed. No one said, Lisette, you have to work this many hours. You have to put in this much time. When I don't do that, there's guilt. Like, oh man, like I could be, I could be doing more. I should be doing more. Now as a mother, it's the same thing. Not only do I need to be doing more here, but I should show up to soccer practice that day. I need to remember that it's pajama day, like whatever the thing is. Right. And so those are self-imposed a lot of times. And so I think it's important to self-assess. Are those things that you're putting on yourself or are they truly required and needed to maintain the important aspects of your life. So I think the self-assessment part is important. And you may find from that, I really need to make a career change. In my case, I did. Um, Or maybe I need to have a conversation with my boss. I'm really struggling, Mm -hmm. right? And being honest. Nowadays, in today's climate, it's, it's way more acceptable for women to vocalize things like that. And if you do that and your company responds with like, too bad, so sad, then you have your answer and you can move on and you can start looking for something else. But that self-assessment component accelerates your process of getting to the place that you want to get to in order to have the flexibility that you need. Mm -hmm. So I think that's number one. The second thing is, I don't know if you've heard this analogy of balancing glass balls versus rubber balls. Have you ever heard that analogy? No, but one breaks and one doesn't. Okay. So there's this common analogy that folks will use that there's glass balls, which are like the, th- the ones you can't drop, like your family, whatever. And then there's rubber balls. If you drop it, you can just pick it back up. So you assessing what that is. Traditionally, it's used in the form of like work is a rubber ball and family is a glass ball. I also think that's BS because my work is really important. So is my family, but my work is really important to me. I like that you say this because a lot of moms won't say that. I know. But I'm not just a mom. I'm not just a mom. It's not exactly all of who I am. This is also something very important to me. Yeah. And eventually your kids are going to grow up. Yeah. (laughs) They're going to leave you. (laughs) (laughs) So I don't take that traditional approach. I think of it as like, okay, if you're playing the game of juggling these balls, right? Glass balls versus rubber balls. Each of aspects of your life that you deem important, you can say, okay, family, there are actually glass and rubber in both of those scenarios. So meaning if you miss the PTA meeting, glass ball, <laughs> rubber ball, 
What? Rubber ball. Oh, no, no, no. You're right. Rubber ball, not the glass ball. No. I got my balls who, mixed yeah. up. <laughs> Rubber ball. Don't mix up Not the important. Ball. I'll, I, I can catch the next one. <laughs> yeah, right? To, like, not a big deal. But a lot of moms would be like, oh, my God, I'm such a bad mom. I'm not there for my kid. But there are aspects of my kids' lives that, like, I cannot pass up. So, for example, teaching them how to be kind intelligent, hardworking human beings that are, are going to be, are going to contribute to society. Those are important to me. So when I find opportunities to spend time there, I'm going to do it. And it's both positive and constructive, right? So an example I use, Izzy, when she was like four years old, she was old enough to know better. And she spit this blueberry on the ground and I was getting ready to go to work. And I'm like, you have to pick up that blueberry. That's very disrespectful. And my daughter. I remember this day. Ooh, she's so strong. I remember this day. I almost day. cried. I, I remember. Oh, I was so overwhelmed. But but this is And I'm like, it's a blueberry. No. <laughs> and you're like, it no, not just it a is blueberry. not a blueberry, Andrea. This is like about lying. And this is about. Yes. <laughs> but but this, is, this is where my mind goes, right? That like these small moments. So explain this. She dropped the blueberry. And I said, Isabella, you have to pick that up. It's very disrespectful. We don't spit blueberries on the ground. She's like, I'm not picking it up. Like she's just not picking it up. I had to go to work. Like, I'm late for work. And I'm not exaggerating. We sat there for two hours until she picked up that blueberry and threw it in the trash. Because to me, there's value in you don't disrespect our household. You don't disrespect me. And we're going to do the right thing. Like, even if it's just a blueberry on the <laughs> ground, we're going to do the right thing. And you could see my leadership right? Showing in this and how I lead. It was great. It's fantastic. But I, I believe in those small moments because those compound, right? Mm -hmm. Right now it's just a blueberry, but as you get older, it turns into something <laughs> worse, right? And so I was late to work that day. I'm okay with that because to me, that's a moment in my kid's life that like, I, I have to teach them better. It mattered. It, it mattered. mattered. It mattered. And so I've learned to not uh, guilt myself over the rubber balls that, uh, I'm, I just can't drop the glass ones. And that, you know, that applies to my marriage, my children, my work. And so when I say, sometimes you have to give a little, um, and take a little and, and you have to be flexible, you know, that, that's kind of what I mean. The third thing I would say is just, we all get overwhelmed. Don't be afraid to ask for help and to say out loud what you need. Like, I need whatever the thing is for you. I need some alone time. I need to walk away. I need uh, to go spend time with my friends, right? To be something other than a boss or a mom or a wife, I need to be who I am, right? And I think, I think all of those things combined, self-assessing, balancing those glass balls, rubber balls. Balancing your balls. Balancing your balls. <laughs> Um, quote, quote, <laughs> tweetable moment, <laughs> balance your balls, balance your balls, Dro drop the rubber ones, They're drop fine. the rubber ones. They're fine. They're fine. They'll be fine. And, and really ultimately like knowing when to ask for help. I say all of this, by the way, that it, it, like I'm privileged. Like I, I, I have a lot of support and help. Everyone's situation is not that way. And so, you know, I, I wish we lived in a country where women were more supported as mothers in our government. And we're just not there yet, right? And so I hope one day that we can get there. But I say all of that, but like asterisks that not everybody has that privilege. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Uh, let's talk about that part of you're a working mom. You choose to be a working mom. You choose to spend a considerable amount of your time dedicated to your work. How do you deal with other moms who uh, might look at that and say, mm, <laughs> but like, do you even mom? Yeah. Like, do you I, get that? Yeah, I do. I do. Do you I, even mom? <laughs> There's this one mom. And does it bother you? It's annoying. Yes, of course it bothers me. I have feelings, Andrea. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, of course it bothers me because you don't feel included in that group. But at the same time, I know myself. I know the contribution that I'm making in my children's lives. And, you know, actually, studies have shown that kids who have working moms actually end up being more successful because they emulate your behavior, mm -hmm. right? And they have an example uh, of that. And I hear it in my kids today. 
and especially now with COVID, I'm working from home. So they get to see me all the time. Yeah. They hear my conversations. They see the meetings that I'm in. Um, Does that help? You know, when your kids are home and you get to include them a little bit more in your work and they get to understand. Yeah. Yeah. Well, actually, thank you for bringing that up. It does help to include them. Absolutely. Before COVID, I did that already. So one of the things that I would do is I would bring them to my office and I think that matters. And I've given this advice to other women who I've worked with who struggle with the same thing. And I would tell them, bring your kids to your work and show them where you're spending your time and what you're doing and the contributions that you're making and who you're helping. Because then you teach your children to look outside of themselves, right? Mm -hmm. That it's not just about um, this house, this my life, what I need from you. Exactly. What other needs is my mom help fulfilling? Yeah, exactly. And so that's helped me a lot. And so they know what mommy does. Like if we, when I worked at Best Buy, they would see, oh, mommy works there. Now that I work at Comcast, oh, mommy works there. And she does this at, at work. That's helped a lot. And so now with COVID, uh, and it's funny, just over dinner the other day, I had this big meeting that I uh, was in and I was really excited for it. And so Izzy's like, how did it go, mom? And I was really excited. It went really well. And she's like, I wish I could be there. And I'm like, oh, do you want to sit in one of my meetings? Like, I'm, you, can, you can sit in if you want. And she's like, yeah, I would love to. So she's seeing this and I'm excited to see how she uses that in her life as she grows up. And Mason's a little younger, so it'll be the same for him. But I think while, you know, people are always going to judge no matter what you do, you're never going to please anyone. I think stay focused on the things that you're working towards and the people you're working for, and it works itself out. It really does. What do you want her to take away as she grows and as Mason grows into their own people? What do you want them to take away from your mothering? Mm-hmm. I say I'm self-conscious about this. I grew up so different from them. They're so privileged. Like they have everything. And so I'm always nervous. I don't want to spoil them. I don't want them to be spoiled. And that's always in the back of my mind and how I discipline them and how I teach them. Is it because when you were growing up, you valued or maybe you learned a lot from not being privileged? Is that what it was? Yeah. We talked about the piggy bank story, but there were other moments growing up. So I was born in a little village, a very poor community. I remember walking in my backyard and there'd be like bullet casings and stuff would get stolen. It was a, I mean, it was a very violent neighborhood. Um, I witnessed my first drive-by shooting there. Like it was, it was real. Yeah. My parents moved us out of the city when I was like in, I don't know, maybe like third or fourth grade. So I was, I remember those experiences but they weren't constant enough in my childhood to make a huge negative impact, I would say. But I do remember like, oh, that's not normal. Like, Mm -hmm. you know, the violence and all of that. When I got moved to the suburbs, we, (laughs) we lived in the poor part of the suburb. You know what I'm (laughs) saying? Yes. yes. So, you know, we would still see gangs and someone got shot in front of my house and yeah. killed, but like on a different level, like on a <laughs> suburb level. And so it was just, it wasn't as constant, I guess, but you felt safer. I did. I felt safer. But when I went to school, like there were the kids who were privileged and they lived in what I thought were like these big mansions at the time. And, and it was a two bedroom. <laughs> yes, it was, it was, I mean, I, I was like, they're rich. They are rich. Like, they're rich girl. And I remember feeling sometimes even ashamed, like, you know, I didn't want them to know where I lived. There was an awareness of a gap. Totally. Mm -hmm. When I was 14, maybe a little bit younger, we we actually moved to Mexico. I don't know if you know this about me, but I lived in Chihuahua for like a year, year and a half. Never knew this about you. You lived in Chihuahua? I did. My, My dad, when he got laid off and then finally got rehired, he um, got hired at this company in Mexico. What did your dad do for work? He is a general manager for a plastics manufacturing company. So management was in your blood, girl. Oh, yeah. He taught, he raised me. He raised me in leadership for sure. But I remember like seeing uh, kids digging through garbage cans, looking for food, like on the drive to school. I remember them 
um, going door to door, begging for food. And then I, I remember like seeing them at the stoplights. It was a very impressionable time. I was mm -hmm. a preteen, basically. And to see that was like, oh, I am different. I have more than they have. And, it, and I always felt sad about that. Did you feel guilty? Yeah, yeah. Even now, I feel guilty now. Like, I feel guilty about, you know, how far we've come sometimes. And I have to kind of taper that down. Of your success? Oh, yeah. Really? Mm -hmm. So what? You, f you go home and you're like, Brett, dang, we messed <laughs> up. <laughs> we no. succeeded too much. You know what it is? <laughs> Explain this to me. It's how could I want more? And then uh, I'm like, how could you be not be so grateful? Yeah, I, I am grateful. <gasps> no, I know. But, but do you think that? But yes. But at I'm a certain, like, like, how could I ask for more? Yes, all the time. And so because of those experiences, I know that I have so much. And so now when I look at my kids and I'm like, they don't have those references. They don't have those experiences. So how do I raise them to be compassionate, kind, humble human beings knowing that they don't have those experiences to draw on. And mm -hmm. so I'm always conscious of that in how, how I parent. And so I, I use different methods to, to help them understand their privilege and understand that you're unique. Like you have a good kid, <laughs> like, and you better appreciate it. <laughs> you know, it's funny. Like, so we have like chores around the house. This is a real story. You're going to laugh. When I tell you this. If my kid is like, they don't want to do the chore and they're being lazy and they're whining and they're like, oh, why do we have what? to do that? If it gets to a certain point, I say, if you keep going this route, you're going to get fired from this job. And if you get you fired, fire your kids from the job, totally, <laughs> I really do ask, ask Brett. It's a true story. But if they get fired from that job, there's also consequences. So if we go and buy something or if like they want a new video game or they want to buy something on Google play, you lost your job, kid, so you don't have money to pay for that. And and so using those references in our day-to-day, -day, you have to get creative. But it's a goal of mine, like, you can't be a spoiled little brat. And like, it teaches a lesson. I hope so. <laughs> yeah, things are taken away. Yeah. Right? And you don't get to experience the... The feeling of the success that we've had now is the result of so much sacrifice and work and blood, sweat, and tears. I mean, I've cried. I've worked to the point of no return to, to get to this point. And so no one sees that. They just see what's on the surface, right? But um, how do you get through those moments where you're doing everything that you can? You're trying your hardest. You're, you, you've got the glass balls intact, but sometimes <laughs> it feels like... I'm about to drop one? Yeah, it's slipping. Like, you know, those rare, like authentic low moments of professional career development, how do you get yourself through that? Like, who do you go to now? Like in those situations, what do you say to yourself? What's that self-talk? Yeah, I mean, I think... I think and we, you have that, no? Oh, yeah. Yeah, right? Yeah, I mean, yeah. I've had those moments this year, quite frankly. You know, we've had to deal with uh, the pandemic and all the civil unrest that's, I mean, you're leading people. All these people you're leading are, are impacted by what's happening in the world. Mm -hmm. And all these people have different feelings, different oh, perceptions, yeah. different realities. To you and they're like, what now? What are yeah. we going to do? Hell, yeah. And so I've had those moments where I've literally sat in a room and I'm just thinking to myself, like, I don't know how I'm going to do this. Like, this is really hard. And feeling like I don't have the answer. And we were talking about taking that first step earlier. Like, I don't know what step I'm going to take next. Yeah. And, you know, I think when I'm in those moments, I don't let myself stay there too long. Sometimes it's a benefit, sometimes not so much. But It's an indulgence, I think, right now. Like... I know I need to have this moment and I, I don't know if I can take it. What do you do? Yeah. I mean, I think number one, like staying in my feelings part, it's just not my favorite place to be because it's a loss of, to me, it feels sometimes like a loss of control. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, that, that sucks. Like, I don't like that. <laughs> um, who likes that? Who wants that? <laughs> right. I like to be in control, but you are human. And so you have a human reaction to the things that are happening. You get overwhelmed you lose your way. And so this year has been that for me so many times. And what I do in those moments, I think you talk about your support system. Like for me, there's a go-to, I have a go-to at work. Like 
if I am feeling overwhelmed, like I don't know, I have a mentor and I've always had a mentor of some sort, both at work and outside of work. I ask for help in those places. And so when I'm feeling that way, I go to them and I just, it's almost like even just to release it helps to clear your mind Mm -hmm. on what that next step is going to be. And so oftentimes I call them up and I'm like, do you need to start venting? And I'm really struggling with whatever the thing is. And the act of just saying it out loud helps you move forward. If you want to be successful in any professional setting, and quite frankly, even in your personal life, I think having that that person that's a safe space is so important. And it's it's so important to have that. You don't have to have a lot of them. You just have to have that one person. You just need one guides, yeah, at a time. Yeah, and they guide you. And so who do you look for? What do you look for? For me, I have a... So when I was a director at Comcast, her name is Julie. She's a saint. <laughs> She's a VP of HR now. At the time, she was a director and I was newly promoted. And it was one of those Andrea moments, honestly. We knew each other already, obviously. We worked with her, but she came up to me after a meeting and she goes, hey, I know you were just promoted. If you ever just need to talk, like, don't be afraid to put some time on my calendar. And I was like, okay, oh. let me let me schedule that. <laughs> and when people reach out like that. Do it. Take, take it. Like, take that chance. They've opened the door. Walk in. Uh, And so she said that, and I'm like, I'm putting some time on your calendar. And so that's how our relationship started, this, you know, this mentorship. And so since then, and that was maybe like three years ago, I've had time on her calendar once a month. And sometimes we talk about nothing. And sometimes I have some, you know. Yeah, this year you probably had a lot. I had a lot. (laughs) And, you know, and she guides me, right? She helps me to, to, to kind of find my way. You know, when you find those people that like, have a genuine desire to make others better, hang on to those people and, and keep them close and be deliberate about nourishing those relationships because there's not a lot of those people out there, I don't think. No. Um, and, and, and I think when you find them, I think they're special and, and, and you should nourish those relationships. And so I, on the personal side, like my girl time, like girlfriends that I, I love that time. And we need that time. Yeah. To, to have no label Mm-mm. other than I'm just your girl, I'm just your friend. And we couldn't have, this is important, I think, because we couldn't have that relationship still working together. No. There's no way. There's no way. Yeah. But it took afterwards and it's like, hey, <laughs> you want to go hang out? <laughs> <laughs> let's, go, let's go drink. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, you know, I think everybody has those moments where you're overwhelmed and it's this year especially has been so, so tough for, for so many people. So what's the eye on the prize now? You're in a great position. You have what you want. What inspires you to keep going now after you reached a level of success that you're really happy with? I think more than anything, obviously, you know, my kids, Mason is six, uh, Izzy is nine, and they're learning. I mean, they pick up on everything. This year has been a really wild year for everyone. I've spent a lot of time teaching them about what it means to be inclusive and what's happening in the world in a way that they could understand. There's actually this movie on Disney about Ruby Bridges. And so we sat and we watched it. And um, if you if you get a chance to watch it with your kids, and so it talks about how she, Who is that? Ruby Bridges is back when there was segre- segregation, she went into this all white school that was obviously at the time there was segregation. And so she goes into the school They show these scenes of her walking into the school and there's all these protests. And um, it, it's basically shows it's a true story of her experience in being one of the first, you know, black girls to go into this all white school. Mm-hmm. And she's this little girl. And so when a kid watches that, it's like, you know, why are they treating her that way? And so we start to have these conversations, but I share that with you because I think both personally and professionally, I've been um, on this journey of, of learning how to be a better ally and learning how to create a more inclusive environment in the workplace. You know, people talk about diversity, equity, and inclusion. People say DE&I. Oftentimes people forget the equity and inclusion part and they mm-hmm. think 
just because you hired a person of color means you're diverse. You're diverse now. Yeah, that's not. We did it. Yeah. <laughs> and and it's that's like the little baby step. That's like a check the box. Mm-hmm. And so now I've, you know, like, oh, I made it. Like I may, I'm in this role. So what am I going to do with it? What influence do I have now? And how do I leverage that to help other people? The Andreas of today who are like, oh man, she looks like me. She's Latina. She's a female. Look, look how far she's come. Yeah. What can I do so that that's not so astonishing anymore? Like I'm now in a position where, uh, and I, and I always have been right. Just by the act of being, Mm -hmm. you're in a position to show that it's possible, but I'm very conscious of the fact that as I grow in my career even further, that there's an opportunity to really make a difference. And there's learning in that for me too, right? Because I only know my experience as, as a woman of color. I don't know the experience of, you know, a person who is gay or a person who is black or, you know, whatever, the, whatever it is. I don't know those experiences. And so, and so how do I become more conscious about what their experience is like? How do I make an environment that's more inclusive for them? And then on the personal side, how do I raise kids that get that, Mm -hmm. that, you know, are compassionate, understanding, maybe even observant. And kids are, kids are so interesting. You know, one of the, one of the things I think about, so I have a boy and a girl and I believe a woman can do anything a man can do, but the way that, that kids are socialized, it's not just in parenting, but in everything that they see. So like an example would be Mason, when he was a little younger, would say, I don't like pink. Pink's just for girls. And you're like, nope. And I, I pause. It's another one of those moments where I'm like, hold on a second. Why? This is a glass ball. <laughs> I have to pause here because why do you think that? This is a glass ball. This is a glass ball. A like, I can't drop this ball. This is a moment where I create his, his little character. Like, I, I remember like, well, why do you think that? Well, I don't know. I just, I just think pink is for girls. Well, some boys wear pink. And if you like pink, that's okay. Okay, mommy. Like, that makes sense. And so now they repeat that. Mm -hmm. I remember Izzy having a conversation with one of her friends. And I don't know how it came up, but I was listening to them. And Izzy uh, says something like, oh, yeah, like, if this girl married that girl. And her friend's response was, well, that's weird. And Izzy's response, I kid you not, this was proud mama moment. She goes, that's not weird. Why is that weird? She's like, it's just love. What's the big deal? Duh. But she learned <laughs> that from from us. from you guys. Yeah, we yeah. we were deliberate in teaching them that we would like we would watch Modern Family together, and then I would be deliberate about saying, "Hey, look, it's Cam and Mitch and their husbands." Being very deliberate about what I'm teaching them. My world in my personal life is my children, and so I have an opportunity to create these two people who can be inclusive and can accept people for who they are. And that's it. And we leave it at that. And then at work, how do I continue to be someone who can create that environment at work? And, and I'm not there yet, by the way, Andrea. Like, this has been a year of, of transformation in that space for me of learning. Uh, and I have so much to learn still in that space. But, you know, I think... But is there a part of you that feels like, um, I actually know a bit. I actually know what I'm talking about. In that space? Uh, sure. Yes, because you're in that space because you know a bit, because you've earned it, because you have the experience. Yes. Yes and no. When you think about like... Like I'm flawed, imperfect, and just the right person for this job. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I'm trying to be for sure the, the, the right person. But, you know, the moment we think that we're done learning is when we start dying. Yeah. And I think for me, it's like, it's like you leveled up. (laughs) That's such an intense statement. (laughs) The moment you stop learning and growing is when we start Start dying. dying. It's true though. Like, then what are you doing? Yeah. What what the hell? Like, what are you (laughs) doing What are your goals? Yeah. (laughs) And it doesn't always have to be like. Do you think that's just personality? I hope not. (laughs) You're like, nope. (laughs) I really hope not. Because here's the, think about our parents, right? Like, okay, so for me. My mom, you know, when we were kids, she would make statements about like people of color or. um, Was she racist a little bit? 
Yeah. And it was a cultural thing. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Like, well, and, I can't speak for other cultures. But from a, I could yeah, speak from a Mexican from family. From a Mexican perspective, yeah. it's, it's a thing, right? And I remember like my junior prom, I went with someone who was biracial. And she, she didn't say anything mean, but I could tell she had a reaction to that. And so now fast forward to today, I have a lot of black friends, right? And she loves them. And I think when you think about like, she learned that later in life, that experience came to her later in life. And so you have the power to grow as an individual, regardless of your age, if you're 70 or if you're 18, just becoming a supervisor, like you have the power to learn and, and to make an, an influence on people. And so I think like, if I were to get here where I am today and say, I made it, like I'm good, then I would have wasted it. I would have wasted this opportunity to pave the way for other Lissettes and Andreas and other people who felt like maybe it wasn't possible because of their upbringing or because of the color of their skin or whatever it may yeah. be, right? And so I don't know if it was the reaction of that I had from many people in my promotion. Like, you know, I had a lot of people inside the organization who were Hispanic, who were female, who were so proud. They don't even know me. No, they don't have to know you. <laughs> they don't have to know you. <laughs> but they were so proud. And then... Your success is theirs. Yeah, yeah. And and then there's like this moment in time that we're in right now where people are so angry. And I feel like to me, it's this moment where, okay, like you got to step up. And so you have to learn. Like you have to learn how do you make an impact in this space because you have the privilege to do it. And because someone else probably did it before me and that's why I'm here. Right. And so it's probably less about accolades or achieving like the next promotion or, or it's not about making more money. Now it's like, OK, well, how do I use this, this stage to help pay it forward and, and pay it back to, to, to other people? Who, and that's how you do it yeah. is by continuing to push yourself. Yeah. 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 And using your privilege and power truly in a way that can enact more of that down the road. Yeah. So let's talk about power, right? You're in a seat that very few women are in and you're younger than a lot of women and you're beautiful. You, you seemingly perfect, right? Perfect. Is there anything else that's a secret sauce or that one ingredient that says, yeah, this is kind of how I got here. Let's talk about confidence. confidence. Let's talk about confidence. Man, it, you know, I don't know that I, people have always described me as confident. Yep. If I had to choose one, two words for it, uh, trailblazer, confident. Yeah. Did you ever take StrengthsFinder? Mm -hmm. So StrengthsFinder, one of my top themes was command and um, self-assurance. And, you know, this idea of kind of commanding your space and commanding your, your voice in a room <clears throat> and... I faked it very much when I was younger. And I remember because I was so young in these leadership roles, I would often like be preparing for a meeting. And I was so intimidated because there are all these men who are much older than me, have way more experience. They sound so smart. They know what they're talking about. And I would get so nervous. And I would go to my dad. And my dad... My dad raised three girls, uh, along with my mom, of course. But one of the things that he always instilled in us was this idea that, like, you are just as good, if not better, than the next person. And it was ingrained in us, I mean, in everything. I remember this stayed with me forever. He would say, if, if you were the janitor, you better be the best janitor that, yeah. like, which Which took your uh, bagging... That's yeah. why you were like, I'm going to be the best bagger. Yeah. And so there's this confidence of like, I can do it. I can be the best. But that then if you have to be the best, you also have to work really hard to get there. Right. You have to outwork everyone else. You have to be more prepared than everyone else. And so I, I think if I had to summarize it in one word, it would be like having the confidence in yourself. And how do you get that? Like, there's a lot of people who are like, yeah, OK, cool. Like, 
like yeah. confidence, but how do you do that? Being confident doesn't mean that you're not nervous or that you're not intimidated or it's almost like when people describe the idea of courage, like courage doesn't exist without fear. Mm-hmm. Right? Or vulnerability. Yeah. And so with confidence, I kind of view it the same way. Like you, you have to, even if you're scared, even if you're nervous, even if you screw it up, that you do it anyway. Mm-hmm. And the more that you do it and you push yourself, your confidence builds because then you learn how to do it. And so I remember my dad would always reinforce, hey, those people in the room, they're really not that much smarter than you. Like they just have more years on you. Yeah. So they're normal people. They're not that smart. And then what I came to learn when I would go into well, these you're rooms. You're not that smart. It's like, I can do what you're doing. <laughs> I got this, right? And no, a lot of them were very smart, but it wasn't to this point that I could not reach. Yes. Right? And so I was always very observant about not just the the knowledge that people had, but how do they get that? And then how do I add to my repertoire, right, of things that I need to learn? And I do that to this day, by the way. And so, you know, I think this idea of confidence, if you have kids, above anything else, I would say, like, make them believe in themselves, remind them, tell them, like, make sure that they know that they're capable of so much and that they know their power. And I think as parents, like, if we can keep doing that with our children, like, they can go and be happy with whatever they want to do, right? And you say that there is a superpower. Everybody has a superpower, right? Everyone has a superpower. Everyone. In the workplace, if you lack confidence, where does that come from? Is it you're afraid of presenting in in front of people Is it the actual content of your work? Uh, What is it that's driving that? One way to really combat that is to over-prepare. And so when I found myself in those situations where I'm really nervous and I'm not feeling my most confident self, I put in the work and I prepare more for for that moment in time, right? If it's doing more research or talking to more people about whatever I'm preparing for, gathering my thoughts, I remember... When I was uh, interviewing for the director position that I had at Comcast, <laughs> my boss at the time, he was, one, he, was a, he was a good boss, but he said to me, he said, just so you know, you have competition. Like, you're not a shoe in so you need to do the work. Not that I was planning on not doing the work, but that just... Fueled you. Oh, my God. And then I was like, oh, my God. This is competition. <laughs> no, I was like, shit, this is a competition. And so... I felt nervous and I wasn't as confident. So I practiced. I practiced my interview. I recorded myself. I'm not even exaggerating. I probably did over five hours of recording time in interviewing practice so that I could draw forward the ideas of the things that I had accomplished and and anticipate what questions they were going to ask. But walking into the interview, I felt confident. Not because I think I'm smarter than everyone else. But you were prepared. I was prepared. I was ready for that moment. And I knew that whatever question they were going to ask me, like, if I didn't know the answer, then I wasn't ready for that job. In a a few of the other podcasts, we had Shannon on, we had Raul on, and they both mentioned you in their own journeys. You said it earlier, keep those people close who, who make other people better. How do you identify that? What stands out to you? How do you know this is a person who should be developed or or can be in larger ways? When I look at people who I work with, regardless of where they are, it's do they have a genuine interest in helping others and helping the team and helping someone other than themselves? Because ultimately, those are the people that make good leaders. You know, if you think about leadership, it's like a thankless job, You get blamed when things go wrong. And if you're a good leader, you give the credit to To other people, your your team. Yeah. Right. And then you deal with all of the, 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 the challenge of leading people. People are complicated in a lot of ways. And so when you have somebody who is uh, selfless in that way, who just want to help others, regardless of the setting or profession, those people will multiply their goodness. Like that superpower that they have, if they are looking at where they can add value and where they can help, they're going to multiply that. And so those are the people that I tend to hang on to or that I pull in and say, hey, do you know you have something special? 
like use that. Sometimes all they need is a nudge. I think when you ask like, what do you look for? It's, are they willing to, to, to help and to add value in service of others? Mm-hmm. I think that's really powerful when you find that. You mentioned a few people who made significant impact in your life. And I always ask us like, who are the three most pivotal people that when you look at your life and this changed the direction of, of my life in a good or bad way, it doesn't have to always be good. Who are those people? Hmm. Well, the first one is my dad. My dad, in a lot of ways, was my mentor in my early years, uh, my leadership mentor. I would use his examples at work, and people were like, you're so wise. <laughs> <laughs> I know. But it was all my dad's stories and my dad's experience. But he really kind of pushed me towards the leadership path. Uh, and yeah, so, if you're going to be working, you might as well be the best. Yeah, and the so leader. exactly. And so he he really pushed me in that space. And he and I connected on, there's people like when you love your craft and you get to talk to somebody uh, about your craft, you're like, you're like cheesy about it. Like you, you could talk about it all day and you could talk on the phone for hours about it. And so my dad, he moved away when I was younger, like when I was preteen years and he was gone after that. He, he didn't live with us, but I still had this really close relationship with him because we would, we would talk every day on the phone and I tell him about work and you know, all my challenges. And so I think like my dad is definitely one of those people. If I have to name a second person, it of course would be Isabella because she was my first kid Child, yeah. and she's my daughter. So, you know, teaching her how to be a woman. What did like, she teach you? Oh my God. Patience for sure. She taught me patience, but she also, I would not have considered myself a feminist prior to my daughter, but after my daughter, I feel like I became one. I think I've shared the story with you before. One of the nights I was putting her to bed and she didn't want to sleep in her, in her bed. She was scared. And I was like, I was like, kiddo, Mason's like in his room right across from you and he's fine. Like he doesn't get up. He's not scared. There's nothing to be scared of. And she said to me, yeah, but he's a boy and boys don't get scared and boys are stronger than girls. And it shook me to my core. It was one of those moments where I was like, I have to- glass ball. Glass it was ball. a glass ball. Glass ball. <laughs> Girl, it was a glass ball. I, the next morning I woke up and I was inspired. I was like, you got the book. I got the book. <laughs> so for anybody who has daughters, I strongly encourage Rebel Girls. You should get some marketing dollars for that, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> but Rebel Girls books, it basically is a book that's compiled of all of like the badass women that in history and in current times, you know, you've got like Malala. Girl, this is the Rebel book. <laughs> this is the Rebel yes, book. Yes, <laughs> In and real so, time. I think she was five when she said that. And every night I would read to her about these powerful, strong women. And now fast forward, she's nine. You talk to her about being a girl and sh- she will tell you how strong she is and how girls can do anything. And, and she's an advocate for girls. To me, like that was a leadership moment that I wasn't ready for, like as a mother, I, mean, yeah. I wasn't ready for that moment. And then I had to step up to the plate. Like We can't go down this path where you think that, like, for some reason, boys are better than girls. Like, that's not, that's not, we're not doing this. Yeah, we're not doing this. And so definitely my daughter would be the second. I think the third would be my husband. And, you know, my husband, uh, so you know, Brett, shout out, Brett, shout out, Brett. Um, But he has challenged me to, be more trusting and to be more vulnerable. And that's been hard work. It's been really hard work. And I don't know that the work is done, but uh, I don't know that I've ever allowed myself to be as vulnerable as I have been with him. And really the way he's gotten me there is he's just the most patient person on the planet. Could you have reached your level of success without him? No, absolutely not. I was always jealous of, as I moved up the ranks, I was always jealous of my counterparts who had, they had stay-at-home wives. 
So, yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> when they had to work more, it was like not a big deal for us. We had a war room. We have a war room with a whiteboard of all of the moving pieces because he has a pretty demanding job as well. And I mean, it was just like this, this war room of who was going to do what each day, who was going to pick them up, drop them off, who's going to, whose job was more important that day. Oh, we had those battles. (laughs) Um, and, and, you know, I think if, if you were to ask him, it wasn't easy for him to come to this place of her career is important to her. I think, I think there was always this kind of push and pull between us. And we've had to have the tough conversations of, like, this is important to me, and so we have to find a way. When we were having those conversations, it was like, how do we outsource some of the things in the house, right? Like the cleaning and the chores, like whatever, anything Mm -hmm. that could lighten the load for us because it, it sometimes was very overwhelming. But through it all, he has been so patient, has been so supportive of my career. He's never made me out to feel like I didn't deserve everything that I've had. And I think that's unique to have someone who is a champion for you in that way. And a support, like a champion and a support. Yeah. You're willing to serve in a support role to yeah. help make those dreams possible and vice versa. Yeah. Right? Yeah. We're so different. And you know this. It's, but it's a perfect match. Yeah, we're, we're polar opposites. But he's so... He's Describe just, him so other people know. If, if someone's like you, what should they be looking for? Well, he's hot. I think he's hot. I think he's very good looking. Um, no, but that's the only reason I married him. No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> he, he would say the same thing. She's hot. <laughs> no, Two he, kids, girl. I know, but he, he's so nice. He's, he's the just, nicest. He's so nice. If I had to think about like the nicest... <laughs> <laughs> friend I like the he's the nicest friend I have yeah he's, truly what's unique about him that I don't this is not my superpower this is his superpower he feels what other people feel yes he, <laughs> not, not your not superpower me, not my, you gotta you gotta talk me through Lisette, it you made me feel this way <laughs> yes you gotta say it out loud you gotta verbalize it he sometimes like we'll be in a social setting and you appreciate this oh it's yes. not right like no this is a one because you don't thing. like feelings doesn't mean you don't like people with feelings. That's right. It means- <laughs> I just, I don't, I don't like spending time in that space. Yeah. But I, I recognize that I have them too, right? Like it's a, it's a normal part of life. But he, we will be in a social setting and we'll be driving home and I'll be like, did you notice that whoever, did, she didn't seem like herself today. Do you think she's okay? And I'm like, what? Like I was drinking. I was not paying attention. I was drinking my wine, talking. But th- but this is what he says. Like, did you notice so-and-so is not, not themselves? Like, I really hope they're doing okay. And I'm like, okay. So then the next day I'll call them. And they, something was wrong with them. Like they were upset about something. So this is who he is. He's the best father. He has taught me how to be a better parent. He's so good with the kids and it's things that I didn't have growing up. Like my, both my parents worked. And so there wasn't this idea of like parents spending deliberate time with the kids. Yeah. Like, no, just, there, I don't know if that was like normal at that time. Frame. Cause I remember the same, it was like a lock key, you know, kid, yeah. like you have your own key, you take care of yourself at nine o'clock, you put yourself to bed. Yeah. And then, and then like in the summer, you're home alone all day? All day. I was like, mom, you left us home alone. Like, <laughs> Where were you? <laughs> they, they were working. <laughs> She's like working. <laughs> they were working. And so, you know, that's where I came from. But for him, like he's had this like idea of the kind of family he wanted to have. And he's made that a reality and, and he's played such a, such a big role in that. And so he's taught me how to be a better parent and slowing down. And he came up with like, we do like adventure days where, you know, he'll take one of the kids and it's just their day. So then I'm like, well, shit, if you do I adventure days, I got to do adventure <laughs> days. So now it I might have to gonna be better. Right? Like now I have to go. To, no, his are better. He's more fun. He's just, he's made me a better person. And he's, he's challenged me, Andrea, in ways that no one else possesses the power to challenge me in the way that he does. Describe. <clears throat> like, give me, give me a good one. Let's that. <laughs> like being vulnerable. We talked about like, I don't like to spend time in feelings. I'm very good at compartmentalizing, meaning like, okay, this thing upsets me, but I'm going to put it right here. 
Yeah. And then I'm going to walk away from <laughs> it. <laughs> it's still there. Right. And I'm coming that way. <laughs> and I'm going to walk away and I'm going to go spend time over here and I'm going to just let that be for a little while and eventually it'll go away. But with him, he's so important to me that I can't do that. It, you can't do that with the be, people you love. Yeah. Like you just can't. And so in order to make a marriage work, you're like, fuck, I have to deal with this. Yeah. And, and you have to be vulnerable through his patience. He's never asked of me that of which I can't give. I don't know if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Like if I can't give you all my trust right now, which by the way, has nothing to do with him. It's my own, yeah. my own trauma, my own issues. He's accepting of that. Like he accepts that. Like, yeah. like I don't judge you for it. I'm not mad at you. I understand why you're in this place and I'm going to support you and accept you. And I'm going to wait. I'm going to hold space for you. Yes. And so that's what he does. And then I'm like, shit, now I have to hold space for you too. Yeah. Damn it. yeah. <laughs> so we've been together for thir 13 years. What I have been proud of is we've grown together and we've helped each other become better versions of ourselves. I think that's what you want in a marriage, right? And that's all you could ask for, I think. Mm -hmm. So yeah, my dad, my daughter, and my husband. Well, Lisa, we covered so much and I appreciate you. I think this was informative. I think this was real, honest conversation about real life, the things that we go through. Uh, with our families, with our marriages, with work. Yeah. And you're someone who I look up to you. Aww, and I think that you. I think that there's always a need to have those people in your life that are aspirational. Mm -hmm. And I hope you never lower your standards. Thank you. Well, I'm so happy to be here. And thank you for having me. And I look up to you too. I've been so proud of you and everything that you're doing. And I'm, I'm, I was just excited to be here and to get to experience it all. So thank you for having me. Of course. All right. Well, I think that's a wrap. That's a wrap, people. Thank you for listening to Tuesdays with Andrea. There are hundreds of thousands of podcasts out there, and I appreciate you making the time to listen to mine. If you like this show and want to know more, check out TuesdaysWithAndrea.com or please leave a review on iTunes or drop a line in the YouTube comment section. Until next time, please stay kind in your mind, nice on the web, and stay hella hopeful in your heart.